I'm Dan Jones. I'm the creative director for the White Bear Lake Area Historical Society. With me this evening is Sarah Hansen, our executive decor, uh, director for the White Bear Lake Area Historical Society. We just like to say it a lot instead of W blots. It's a horrible acronym, but it is what it is. We do. So this evening is part four, and we had some folks ask, well, what happened to part one, two, and three? Well, COVID ate them up, but they're still out there. Um, they are on the YouTube channel. If you get to our website, we will turn those on. We turn programs on and off for obvious reasons uh, because we want people here enjoying it. Some people. Anyways, I'm too familiar with some of the folks in the neighborhood. All right, so tonight we're talking about Bald Eagle Otter Lake, which is an extremely interesting area. And one of the things that we've learned through the first three programs, it's not just about what we're trying to present. It's guess what? It's a two-way street. Some of the things we just can't find out, we don't know, we don't have the time, whatever it is. So we're gonna start this presentation. This is not the last time that we'll ever do this. So if you've got some secret nugget hiding as far as what that street is or what that is, there's a, there's a lot of them in this uh, bald eagle neck of the woods and uh, along with Otter Lake. So with that, we'll get started. Wanna say thanks to the Ramsey County Library and the Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment for funding this program and helping out and being a partner of ours. So this is, stop that. This is our area in general. And really everybody knows where the railroad tracks and what does the railroad tracks signify? North of that, I am in where? Municipality wise. All right, so that's really where we're concentrating on, but it's basically from Centerville you can see the dark area, Centerville, really kind of over to Portland. We're not going to cover every single street or court, but most of them we will, the ones with highlights on it. So we always start out with, well, where, where, where do we track back to? Well, the earliest map was, I'm going to have this fun, French cartographer, and I forgot my notes because I'm going to need them. That's why Sarah was... So that's French cartographer, mathematician, astronomer. I don't know how many things a guy can do, but he came in, was hired by the, fir uh, the first person hired by the federal government to come in and map the area. And if you can see, guess what, what? Not everything is accurate as you may want it to be, or we think it is, but you got Fort Snelling. Notice the spellings are always fun. He's French, we're used to that in this area. So Carver's Cave, have no idea. Maybe somebody does. But it's really interesting to see. There we are, and there is two lakes. Could be represented as Onika up there. That was very important to the natives uh, of the time. So we don't know. So that's the close-up of it. Then we come to the survey map of 1848. What's happening in 1848 or really the next year? 1849, Minnesota becomes a territory. So we're getting out on our own, so they're going to come out and survey, and the townships are being set up at this time. That's six mile by six mile block being set up, and they're pretty much just following the lines that had been established at Sarah, I don't know what other state, when they finally did set up, set up that system, but they literally just continue the grid as best they can. Okay. And again, they don't work out to the border of every single thing, but it's basically our township is six miles by six miles. What was interesting about this map to me is that this, the island, it was really weird how they did a big thing about, they didn't know where this island was. And there was like four denotations and a special drawing to determine the exact location of that island. I think they spent more time on that than the entire map Put together for the township. It was just really, it was fun to read, but it was just interesting. So that's 1848. Then we move on, and this is the maps that we have found that actually give detail to 1867. So this, Sarah, I'm going to use my partner in crime. Is that what we think it is at that time in 1867? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I didn't mean to do it. It is 
possibly the railroad. They knew where it was going. It probably it didn't come through White Bear until 1868. So this is 1868 is when it came to White Bear. Well, yes. So they knew where it was going. So that's the demarcation. Now, notice that we're getting names dropping in now, some of which you would probably recognize here and there, um, and that the land is getting sold and getting platted out. And you'll see platted developments come and go along these maps. You'll see this whole neighborhood drawn up, never happens, just never happens. And this one, if anybody lives on the kind of the northeastern side, you might recognize that name, and we'll talk about that later. So, keeping on going, 1886. 1886, 1887, like Sarah said, private uh, contractors are coming out to do this, but we are learning things. Names are changing as who's owning land back and forth, and you can really see what's happening here. Who is from actually from the town of Bald Eagle or wants to be? Who would say we're Bald Eagleites? No. <laughs> no. Yes, ma'am, sir. Caroline lives in Thomas Milner. We'll talk about him. The abstract that I have indicates that he bought that land from the U.S. government in 1867. That is correct. That's very interesting to see that very start. This is 1886, and the other one is 1867. Yep. I don't know much about him. I know that there's a Quit stealing my thunder, Paul. We're getting to him. <laughs> no, but that's exactly right. I mean, these are where you see characters, and that's what's cool. Some you just see names you'll never recognize. You'll see them pop up 20 years later. The name's gone. You'll never hear it again. Other ones you continually see again and again and again. Freeman is just one that pops up primarily because I don't know a lot about what's going on with Mr. Freeman. Could be Miss Freeman. A lot of women owned property. A lot of women. <sighs> That's a good question. I'm going to pass that one to my boss. No. Um, multiple reasons. Uh, I, I would assume it's for financial reasons and things like that to split the, split the wealth. All right. So moving on. Yes. I'm sorry. I just wondered if you would point out Bald Eagle Avenue. Okay, Bald Eagle Avenue is right there. Okay. All right. There it is again. So, skip. So, here you see 1887, and the amount of detail I'm going to go back and forth. You can kind of see the areas growing and creeping out. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm conch. I'm remote control deprived. Um, Extra railroads coming through, just more detail comes in and out. Names are changing. Then we skip forward 10 years to 1898. Notice, like, since we brought up Milner, that was Milner's property right there getting subdivided. Chunks are being sold off depending on where they're going. So, again, here's your bald eagle coming up. There's your basically your Highway 61, correct? Depends on who owned it. Depends which which I mean, for those of you I learned from the Ball Legal Water Ski Program, right? I mean that island, who that, that whoever owned it at that time back in the fifties, sixties, just said go ahead do whatever you want, didn't care who was out there or you know using it, and practice was done out there. Um, other owners are a little bit different of that island. They come and go. There's my Freeman guy. So then we jump to 1916. Things are starting to get a little bit crowded. Notice the initials coming in. That's the biggest thing I take from this map is all of a sudden things are getting crowded. And I tried to take each map and try on the screen to make the lake the same size, but it was, you know, it's not perfect. Yes. So 1916, and then we come to 1920, and good luck with this. <laughs> These these are from plat books where each one of these each one of these sections that you're seeing here is about I'm guessing 30 inches by 30 inches. They're huge. I mean the person I think it was Meg. I mean you could see them taking pictures. You know their toes were coming in at the bottom. 
So I took them and sewed these six together to give us a map. But what's great is that it's high resolution, so we can really zoom in and see stuff, which we will do on future slides when we're talking about that. Doesn't really help us now. Okay, so pop, pop, pop quiz. Yes? One more note on the 1916 slide. That's the same year they put the dam up in Washington. Oh, really? That's good information. Huh. Yes, thank you. Might want to copy Washington County. Do they know? What's their records? Anyways, so how do I know if I'm in Township or the city of White Bear Lake? Water bill. Wow. Bam. Brown if you're in the township. Green if you're in the city. All right. So that's just a little difference because there is some overlap on names. I know in program three, we got into Columbia Park area where it goes in and out, and some of the neighborhoods do have these oddities. All right, well, you can't talk about the entire region, or Bald Eagle for that matter, without talking about the railroad. That brought everything else up in 1868, right? Everything really from that point on probably grew from 500 to 1,000 residents, maybe in the entire area to double that very quickly to then probably sat from two to 3,000 until the late 20s. But it really did. It made us the resort community. The, you know, for that window of time frame, it made it easy to come up, enabled places, for example, Wildwood on White Bear. So the Lake Superior and Mississippi Railroad came up and it very quickly got in use. So there's the old Bald Eagle Depot. This is the one that I forgot to ask you, Sarah, or anybody else. Anybody remember when this came down? Right, but I'm assuming 60s, 70s, somewhere in there? Okay. See, I told you this was an interactive presentation. It's not, it is. It's not, the, this is not the standard. This is all good. So with the advent of the railroad doing what it's did and the car coming on in the early 1920s, welcome to the automobile. So I, this is one of my things that I get hung up on because what I like is visuals, obviously. So this was one of the only maps I could find that was early on that showed Bald Eagle with Highway 61. Well, White Bear, I don't know. We don't know if this blob is it or they just, you know, had to make the state capital so important. I don't know. But it is a fun map for, I mean, they're jamming stuff in there to make it big to read. I don't have any idea what Garen or Republic is, so. Right there, north of Hugo. So that's what's also fun about seeing these old maps. You see these names that come and go, you're like, I, I have no idea. I mean, Hugo in itself will talk a little bit as far as the name, not much, but a little bit. So Highway 61, it, I mean, again, having the railroad was a big thing. Having Highway 61 come through White Bear area, Bald Eagle area, was extremely important. This was like 35 at the time. This was our interstate. Went all the way to Canada, went all the way to Louisiana. This was our north-south from about two to three states each direction as you followed the Mississippi River. I, I kind of laugh, though, when I see it on Google Maps and I see Blues Highway doesn't really apply <laughs> up here, but my dad loved blues, so I won't question that. But I better read some notes if I need it. Um, some, fun fa some fun facts. It continued up Lake, uh, for first off, at the time the highway ran along the lake, it was what's known as Lakeshore, and then came up to today's intersection of Highway 96 and 61 on Lake Avenue. Um, when it turned away from the present alignment and continued along Lake Avenue, this made sense during that time because the population was along the lake with the resorts and recreational activities. It continued up Lake Avenue to Stewart, where it turned north and made its way out of town, connecting what we now know as the alignment of 61 today. It was fully paved in the 1920s and the present alignment through downtown. White Bear really didn't happen until uh, probably the late 30s. Because keep in mind, we had two depots for about a year. They, they, I mean, there's, we have pictures of the intersection where the old depot basically sat in the median just south of 4th. I mean, it was almost in the middle of the intersection. And then they tore it down and removed some tracks, and Highway 61 grew from there to make the traffic go through easier. 
Interesting that Highway 61 dates back to the 1850s as military route going north-south. Of course, along uh, Mississippi River doesn't make, uh, doesn't surprise too many people on that. But in 1926, a federal unified system for interstate travel uh, was created to replace the old motor trail system that was instituted by really private automobile clubs. I mean, I, I you know, we just, we continue to have our presentation of the 1920s over at the Armory. And we've got a little automobile uh, section in that. And what's amazing to me, what I learned is that we still had a blacksmith operating until the early 1920s. So the car hasn't, hadn't really taken over. World War I, you know, put a pause on a lot of that, a lot of that, but it really hadn't taken over. All right, so now we're done with the background on that. We're gonna start off we're going to start off on the right side of the lake or the east side and then work our way down to a big horseshoe and then come back up on the west side. So, of course, we're going to start with County Road J120th, the top of the county. The first thing we encounter is Benson Airport, uh, Benson Farm, really, the whole property. And Benson's were obviously, I'm assuming a lot of people know this, maybe you don't, Benson's uh, were active in the hospitality industry. So it's just, we're starting here with the airport because it is the primary geographic feature, obviously, of the area. And they had a huge chunk of land going through here. And so for those of you, here's Overlake coming through here as a key, uh, what you are. Uh, orchard, does that still, I don't think that still, does it still exist, Orchard does? I'm talking South Cider, so I don't know. But we all know what this is right here, right? That's where the boat, the park is, Ramsey County Regional Park on there. So the airport would be right out here, basically. And there it is, the airport. So the Bensons were known as the hotel uh, folks on Bald Eagle. I'm going to read this. The first landmark, uh, sorry. In 1881, F.W. Benson built the Carpenter House at the corner of Lake Avenue, where Stewart and Second come to a V. The hotel was sold several times, including back and forth to Benson. He bought it back at least twice, I believe. Um, and then it sold it again and it later became Hotel Chateau Gay. F.W. Benson then opened up a second hotel, the Hotel Benson, located on the south shore of Bald Eagle, on the west side of where Bald Eagle and Bald Eagle, where the, every Bald Eagle meets right there. You all know what that is, right? We're just going to say the Bald Eagle intersection, east, west, and avenue and boulevards. I, I just, I need a whiteboard. The Benson family operated the hotel and sold it in the early 1900s where it became the Bald Eagle Hotel. Of course, many of you will know it as Rogalowski's. Rogalowski's, sorry, South Sider. I'm an out-of-towner. Um, so they took over the property in the 40s and ran it for many, many, many years until it was torn down in the 70s. The airport itself was named after Roger Benson. Um, he was actually Lieutenant Roger Benson, the grandson of F.W. Benson, who started it all. Roger was injured in action while serving in the Army Air Force on November 8, 1944, while his plane was attacked and burst into flames. Roger survived the crash, but later died from his wounds. Um, there's so much more to this whole Benson family story that Sarah actually has a presentation all on its own for the Benson family, and it's just not the airport on that. So moving south from there, here we get into what I would call Bald Eagle's Tangletown. But this is, the, love, this is the greatest, coolest little neighborhood, and it's got the greatest names. I mean, O'Connor's Alley, that's got to take the cake as far as any name in our area. Hoxie, Williams Avenue, Gaston. Gaston, Gaston, I don't know, but the neighborhood is really, really, really cool. And this is where the, the names do sound kind of gangstery in a way. And it's appropriate that we kind of thought that because me and Sarah were going through this. And it's like in the neighborhood is a prime location of a gangster hangout. So I wanted to address Gast, Gaston, Gaston, Gaston. This is the one I pointed out earlier. That was, this is actually on White Bear. Probably 
I mean, it could be, Sarah, I mean, I'm guessing west of Ramsey County Beach, it could be where the ice harvest business, it's, it's somewhere, yeah, I don't think it's farther east, but it, it's very difficult to tell on these maps. So on these streets, and again, they just, I wouldn't want to be the snowplower, but it's a great little neighborhood. Um, O'Connor's Alley, coincidentally, this is one of those things that we come across where I'm looking at 1867 and I see a J.M. O'Connor. Don't see him any other time. This could be one of, like one of the investors that we were talking about earlier, drove by, said, hey, let's buy it. Never did anything, sold it, whatever. Don't know. It could be a coincidence. But this is one of the things that we run into is that we don't have the answers on this. But this does lead to Taylor and Eastball Legal, where this is the Idlewild Cottage. That are infamous Ma Barker and the Carpus Gang, or Carpus and the Barker Game, depending on who you want to believe or listen to, um, planned the, uh, rented the cottage in the spring of 1933 and planned a very infamous kidnapping. You're going to have to come to the gangster uh, program for that to find out more on that. But that is the cottage that they rented and it, it still stands today. There's Barker Carpus. And Creepy was his name. I'll give you this one because of his smile. Everybody thought his smile was creepy. There's the cottage, and the owners embrace that at least it was the cottage. They're not saying, hey, gangsters stayed here. This is right at the corner of Bald Eagle and Taylor. So this is East Bald Eagle right here, and then you take the right. And this is Taylor going that way that runs into that neck of the woods of Gaston, Hoxie, O'Connor's Alley right in there. But it's kind of cool. I know we do our bus tours for the gangsters, and we <laughs> drive by there, and they kind of, the homeowners are great. They've never come out and pestered us away, so we really appreciate that. Taylor Avenue is kind of interesting. So this is, again, what we're looking for and what we, you know, if you have any clues or would like to provide information or have even a thought. So we start, you know, who is Taylor named after? And, and you know, so we probably don't have anything, but there are plenty of historical tailors that have been in and out of White Bear. For example, beginning with, there was Colonel Taylor, who was the Minnesota Superintendent of Indian Affairs in 1868. He was a dignitary when the railroad came through. He was invited out, come on, hey, St. Paul, along with a lot of other dignitaries joining him. I believe Senator Ramsey at that time, um, U.S. Senator and the mayor of St. Paul, who was Dr. Stewart, if I remember correctly. I can't remember. I know it. Oh, I just, you know. <laughs> you are off tonight. I'm born off, so, you know. By the way, so we got to take the railroad names seriously because all these names are near, very near downtown. All have connections to the railroad. All of them. So we can't not... So, the, so the, the connections to the railroad. So, like for example, I believe Johnson was the engineer surveyor. surveyor for that. So, Moorhead was an investor, and I believe this is Jay Cook, and it's spelled wrong. I believe Moorhead was the son-in-law of Jay Cook. Wink, wink. Come on in. Let's do some investment. Um, and Banning, I believe, was the president of Mississippi and Superior Railroad at the time. So. You know, come in for a day and let's name the streets after them. The railroad planted in downtown. <laughs> Which, uh, you see, you know, she didn't even give me a chance. <laughs> Which they did for many, 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 many towns. Many times. All right. So that's all around White Bear. Then, again, we've got a guy. There's, uh, there's John Taylor, a local member of the Grand Old Army of the Republic, or GAR. So well, that might be something. Nope. That wasn't it, so let's move on. That's the Civil War statue, by the way, when it was set way back earlier on Clark Avenue. If, you don't, if you're kind of looking at it going, that makes sense. Well, there's Kate C. Taylor, one of the first teachers in White Bear that actually taught out of the old first log schoolhouse. So would that be reasonable to take a nail, Taylor? Yeah, that, that would be reasonable. And then there's Norman Taylor, the home ice delivery guy. Actually, he's probably the best bet of who would name Taylor off of that. So, again, we don't know, but this is where 
it's such a great community to live in that you shake the you shake the can and see what comes out because there are a lot of historic names that have a lot of people that impacted our community. So that's just some of the things that we get into that we just don't know. And if we had just, you know, if we have one more thread connecting those things, we it would just be great. So moving on, we get to the simpler streets. Jim Ashman, I'm going to put you on the spot. Any reason why Short Street is named Short Street? <laughs> it's a short street. How about that? That's it. Listen, we're, we're not going to, it wasn't Bill Short. We're not going to think it, it's a short street. But what's really funny about Short Street is that let's not have one, but two. So let's fly over to Washington Ramsey County line and let's do it again. A really short street and we're going to name it Short Street. So I thought that was right off of Portland as it goes north and you can see the Ramsey Washington line. It turns into, you know, Washington County's like, we're not gonna have any of that. It's gonna be 117th Street. We're done with that. Where's Bill Short? I know, I, I, was, I was crossing my fingers. But no, none of the, the, the streets, Bill's not that old, but he could have been around when the other one possibly was developed. Yeah, but it's not Bill Short. So I'd love to make it Bill Short. So then we get Hugo, you know, Hugo Road that runs north side. You know, it's kind of like basic frontage road along 61. Obviously named after Hugo. Pop quiz, who's Hugo named after? That's one, that's, that is one probably the most, in my opinion, and the researcher of that name, that is correct. I won't even go into the other one. It's not worthy. Victor Hugo, the author of Les Miserables, Hunchback of Notre Dame. That is probably the best bet on that. But... It, but it is the connection. What? I'm sorry? The, <laughs> told you so. Sarah's like, uh, yeah, the connection was whoever was the first postmaster in Hugo liked Victor Hugo, and seriously, that's it. It, it pretty much sews it up. Yep. So then we get into Park Avenue. And these are the, some of the streets that I'd say, you know, we're not going to talk about. We're not going to talk about the numbers. You know, even Jim can figure the, what the numbers and the letters stand for. But Park Street, obviously, guess what? We had Eagle Park coming down there. So Park Avenue, excuse me, as opposed to Park Street, hope nobody lived there because maybe they got each other. They had to been exchanging mail all day long. Park Avenue, because it ended at Eagle Park. So what was interesting at Eagle Park, and for those of you in and around, you know exactly what's coming up that was here, was Spring Park Villa. This is where Spring Park Villa was. There was a natural spring running through the area. I better read my notes in case. All right, let's get to this, get the details. Uh, we can all assume the name Park Avenue is because of Eagle Park, which is depicted on the 1898 map. The park is still listed on the 1920 map, so it remains. Um, also at this intersection was the Spring Park Villa. Opened in 1905, it was built along Bald Eagle with a main building and 15 to 20 individual cottages that actually ran towards this direction. Okay. Um, named for the natural spring located on the property, the villa catered to summer residents and provided rest, relaxation, and recreation for its guests. Um, what was once a country summer home for the Miller family, Spring Park Villa turned into a resort after a doctor post from St. Paul discovered the clear spring of water near the property. The 10-acre natural park area along Bald Eagle offered its guests uh, a stay for a week, a month, or a whole season. Tennis courts were also provided. The resort was open into the early 1930s. However, the family that owned it uh, continued to rent a bungalow. They continued to operate really into the 70s. And we still have people that are within memory that said, yes, I worked there that have been around. So, but it was a very large structure, three stories, two stories probably with, you know, the attic space built out. The cottages though, uh, surrounding it, there was a lot of cottages. So this is a postcard from the time. Then looking off at the lake, their gazebo. All right, so Park Avenue, even though Spring Park, Villa, and Eagle Park went away, still serves a, still an adept name for today because at the other end now is Four Seasons Park. So Park Avenue can still be proud of its namesake and it makes sense. Stillwater Street, Stillwater Street, complicates me a little bit. I scratch my head on it. Does it lead to Stillwater? <laughs> it actually kind of does. 
Um, but that's, that's what's been passed down is that it led to Stillwater. The only thing is you're getting out of town, and we're going to see this in a minute, you really got to get around here. So if this is Stillwater coming out, getting over those tracks, remember Highway 60 wasn't, one wasn't there, so there was very few roads that connected. And so it is kind of weird how they, you know, Stillwater, why they use that. But then again, there's not a lot of east-west streets going south all the way to um, Otter Lake. It didn't go all the way to Otter Lake at this time, but it eventually did. But it went now, basically, our Stillwater Street is Highway 96, basically. Okay. But Stillwater, just, to, you know, everybody thinks of Stillwater pretty much south of the lake, but it does. You know, you run out. There's the view going out to Stillwater. But we go the other way. It goes out of St. Mary of the Lake Cemetery, built in 1893 for the church at St. Mary of the Lake. Beautiful, historic that's another thing. I mean, we've between Union Cemetery and I mean all of them. There, there's some huge, rich, rich, rich history in these. Uh, I mean, for example, one of the presentations I go out to find Al Podvin was the last one, and I'm just standing there at Al Podvin. I look literally right there. There's Jack Yost of Yost Park, and I'm like, they're almost side by side. And to me, that was like really, I'm a dork, so that was cool. All right, I like that. All right, so here we are back at the. We'll just say Bald Eagle, right? This is mainly for a reference of where we are at on Bald Eagle Boulevard, but it bears sense to say, where'd the name come from? Why is Bald Eagle Bald Eagle? I don't know. Why is the sky blue? Why is Otter Lake Otter? You know, why is Goose Goose? We, we don't know, it, with the exception of um, from the very early on, 1856, before we were for a first state, I found this map, it's the earliest map I was able to identify looking through Library of Congress maps that it actually said Bald Eagle Lake and it was before we were a state. So uh, that's true with White Bear for the most part, except for Mr. Nicolet. <laughs> he got one word, right? Um, but Goose Lake is another one. It's been goose for every single map. So, All right, so we're going to keep moving on, but that was just to give you. So we're now kind of heading down Stillwater heading uh, west, and we get to the Mead Park area. Um, this was skinny because these, these Meads kind of get into the next section of what township, Bald Eagle Township specifically, was made up of. Um, the only reference I could find out about Mead was from uh, a, a White Bear History by Catherine Carey. Uh, the Mead family came to White Bear from St. Paul in 1906, doing some further digging thanks to my boss. Um, Census records, 1910 to 1930, Percival and Sally Mead were farmers in the vicinity of the street, and they stretched from where Mead Park is today all the way over to Bald Eagle. That was the, the, their land, kind of they had three different addresses showing up as far as where they were located at. So they were spread across, which is kind of the predecessor to Dillon. Dillon Street is named after Michael and Margaret Dillon, who emigrated from Ontario, Canada, and purchased 80 acres around 1880, and that is the first 80. Notice that we are south. There's our railroad tracks. So this is still township down here, very close, city and township, Columbia Park area. Basically, their land went from Columbia Park over to 35E, and it was kind of a narrow strip. Well, not so narrow, but... Um, Dillon Street continues into the city, and the township has Margaret Street. So I think, yeah. So Margaret Street, well, that was Michael's wife. She was the matriarch of the family. And then we got Grace Avenue down around Columbia Park, and we discussed this at our last, yeah, it was, our, it was three, right? Um, again, running into problems that are fun to try to, Maybe you can't solve them, but at least you get the options, and that's part of the fun. So there's actually three options. Is Grace, who is that named after? It could be Michael's wife, because Margaret's middle name was Grace, or their youngest daughter, born in 1903. Uh, her name was Margaret Grace also. Um, could be Michael's son, Bill Dillon, has stated that his father named the street after his sister, Bill's aunt, Grace. We'll do a test on that after we're all done today, because that definitely... <laughs> needs a, I mean, it's like we're talking about the Vadness family or Peltiers or something. It's like, we just don't have that much room or time. 
Um, but each one of those legitimately could be who Grace is. We don't know. And we were talking earlier, just going sometimes, we just don't know. Here's some options. Um, Michael did die, as we all do, but here's the census records. And so this is funny because in 1885, they came over together. It was just them. And then 1900, boom, here's, here's nine children later. And, and there's still a tenth to come, and that was potentially Margaret Grace of Grace, the name of the street. See how I tied that all together, Doug? But yeah, big, big, big family. So, and they were farmers. Uh, the key with that is Walter. Walter is a key with that, because what Walter, we'll talk more about Michael. Michael, uh, in his obituary, was mentioned as one of the pioneers of the vicinity, and that would be absolutely true on that. But what I'm looking at is this person. All right, as a father of three daughters and a strong mother, I appreciate. Look at that look on her face. All right, I mean, she passed away in 1929. That expression, just she's a proud, strong woman and, and a pioneer to wipe her in her own right. But, you know, I just do that. But Margaret and Michael's second son, Walter, went on to farm land of East Centerville Road, uh, County Road H2, across from basically Hills Farm. We're not going to be talking about Hills Farm this evening. But, Margaret's son, somebody had a camera, and thankfully so. Because this really, in the 1920s, is just awesome to have. And this is very representative of a lot of the street names that you see and park names that you see on the northwest part of the area that we're talking about, west of Bald Eagle, east of Centerville. So I just love that you see this is circa 1920. Remember what I said about the blacksmith? Still needed. They probably shoot their own, I'm assuming. This is the best picture that I could find of the house. We saw bits and pieces. There's all sorts of photography where you get real close-ups of the house, but you couldn't see it out there. This is, we actually pulled this one out. We had to shut the historical society down because of snow this winter. We used that picture saying, sorry, we're closed. But uh, this had to have been in a spring because look at the melt is already happening. But it, <laughs> what a great picture. And then this one, the threshing machine. So this is what kind of this is what I find very interesting. 1920 is that you go from the thresh, threshing machine, you got the tractor, but guess what? Horsepower is still there, still there. And to my knowledge, it was well into the into the early 40s that horses were still being used. Obviously, the farther out you got from the metro area, the more that occurred. But thank you to Walter, whoever took those photos. But it is reminiscent of the next series of roads or streets that we come across. Fisher Street, here's the other thing that we come across, typos, typos. So notice what his name is. That's directly from the 1920 plat. See the C? It's dropped. So. <laughs> so again, Raymond Lavalley, big chunk of land, farmer. Lavelle, Lavelle or Lavalley? You're Lavelle. All right. All right. So the Peterson farm was another one, Alfred Peterson farm. Anderson's going to be the next one, but we have a great picture of the Peterson family. I mean, right there. I love the names. William, Otto, Mabel, Harry, Sam, Gust, Emma and Emma. That obviously was not uncommon to name the daughter after the mother. So Alfred, the father. My favorite, let's get the dog in the picture. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just great to have these photos. But this, I mean, go back to the Walter Dillon. I mean, that's what was happening. Pretty much all the trees had been clear cut. These are open spaces and it was farms. And I think we forget that, that Ramsey County was a lot of farms, a lot of farms at that street. So we keep going a little bit. John Parker, um, 40 acres, he was farming it. And then 
we get to Mr. Milner. I told you. Mr. Milner's kind of fun. So Milner had about three, four properties that kept kind of popping up. I've got this, I've got that. The Milners, uh, they were farmers. Thomas Milner Sr. came to Minnesota from England in the late 1850s, 1857. So his son, Thomas Jr., uh, he was 21 years old, was a private in the Union Army, the 3rd Regiment, Minnesota Infantry Company G. The family remained in White Bear. Many, many family members, including Thomas Sr., are buried at Union Cemetery. Thomas Jr., and I, I've got to connect these two things because well, I hope that maybe they're not connected. Thomas Jr. was president of the White Bear Lake Village Council, i.e., Sarah? That's right. It wasn't. It was White Bear Village Council. Yeah, and we're talking. Yeah, we are talking about names. Thank you. So that was from 1906 to 1909, and he died while he was in office. And he is buried in Union Cemetery. So what was interesting? We were, you know, Sarah was doing some board digging on this. I mean, you go down these rabbit holes. Do you know there was a Milner name proposed at this time, at this time, and this and that? And then there was Bryce Street and Birds. It was just. I'm like, Sarah, we don't have time. I got to finish this up because, you know. But it's, there's, that's what kind of the point to that is there'll be Bald Eagle Part 2. I've skipped over some streets, haven't covered everyone's. We don't have the time to cover it in an hour uh, program. Um, but there's more to these stories. And so that's just what enthralls me. But somebody named Thomas Milner in 1878, pled guilty to using indecent and insulting language and cheerfully paid a fine of $5 for his filthy amusement. <laughs> I, I, we had to, I mean, that was worth it. Come on. I already had that one in the bank, by the way. But I mean, I mean, tell me that's, I mean, I don't know. Was it the son? Was it the father? I don't know, but it certainly, was it either of them? We don't know, but I highly suspect that there's not that many Thomas Milners running around town. So then we go to Hammond Road, and Hammond Road is interesting from the aspect that's been called Town Road, was once designated as High, uh, County Road H, not H2, but H, um, which makes sense because it is exactly one mile north of Highway 96, which is originally County Road G. Uh, and so in 1889, it is Hammond Road, and there's the court, the road record between the county auditor and the township, the board of supervisors all saying, yep, that's happening. There isn't much information on John Hammond, who is listed along with Lena, I believe. If I, there's Hammond, there's several properties. So all the way back to 1867. So that's, that's getting pretty, I mean, we're literally people weren't buying property until 1849 at the absolute earliest, right? But, you know, do we know for 100% sure? No, but there's a lot of coincidences that come up um, because there isn't a lot of information. But his, road, his property generally straddled the railroad tracks along there. And here you can see he's got some more land coming in in 1887. Now, this next one could be a coincidence, but we don't think so. Here's Lena Hammond. So notice that other part, right, this parcel, 1887. So this parcel over here, now Lena's got a hold of it. Again, probably tax evasion. No, I'm kidding. I don't know. <laughs> um, but Molly Wood. So this is one I owe this. We found this one in our last presentation. Sarah picked this up. So this is what I love about Sarah being around. That Well, there was this or this, and her name is misspelled in this. We think it's M-O-L-L-I-E is the correct spelling, but that's neither here nor there. But what rolls around Sarah's head kind of scares me a little bit sometimes. Molly w married a farmer, Charles Wood, and her maiden name was Hammond, no D, which today is incorrectly spelled. So we have a feeling that Molly probably is the daughter of John, married Wood, who we believe has a connection to Wood Avenue, that it's just not the ubiquitous Wood, right, or Birch Street. Um, it actually may have a name to it, but it was just interesting. So we think, the, and you know, coincidence, yes, but the properties that are coming and going and being split, uh, probably not so. So Hammond Road, again, anything, anybody just like, wow, I can't wait to drive down Hammond Road. That's exciting. 
But it is a road that really did connect a lot of things back in the day, and, and it still does. So we got if you want to go to the township offices, you want to go to public works, you want to go to one of the greatest parks in our area, Polar Lakes Park. You want to go to one of the greatest places that you can visit. Let's go to the town, historic town hall. Yes, absolutely. Thank you to the White Bear Township and the White Bear Lake Area Historical Society for co-managing that project together. And we do manage that building together as a partnership and thank the township for that opportunity. But it is a great area. I never, I helped build this sign and I'm never doing that ever again. I do have to credit Keith Isdall though. He did a lot of volunteer work on that. A lot and very appreciative. So it's a shout, chance to shout out to Keith. All right. So Hammond Road, it used to go across and connect over to Centerville, but 35E. So here's where we talk about probably the, besides a lake, the largest geographic thing in that affects our neighborhood, 35E. Massive, right? Didn't connect. Anybody remember when it was connected? When it came out, I should say? Seven? Oh, boy, so you didn't have to put up with all of it. Take the freeway. I, see, I love that story. See, to me, that to me that generational thing is so cool to say, take the freeway, because I tell my kids, well, 35E, take 35E up, and then it's like, well, that, through St. Paul, that wasn't there, right? The practice freeway wasn't there. And we had a cabin on Forest Lake. And that was, yeah, before the freeway. It was always 61. Always 61. Well, it wasn't. And I was born in 50. So. so, well, you took the better way to go. And you got to stop at Jansen Motel, maybe, and stay the night. <laughs> Just saying. As a kid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, so 35E, and here's a great picture. Circa 1970, Jim, you get the star. It was 70-71 when it final, finalized. I could not find a date. To say that it opened over the year we started dating in the valley of what they had yeah so this is hold so this is highway 96 you're looking north so this would be that's h2 coming across paul you had a question i was going to say that when they opened the freeway i was played in like their high school band huh? Seriously, where was that? Where was it? I mean, was it on the bridge? What, I mean, sorry, I'm deli I'm going to be late because of this, but this is uh, fascinating. I wanted to say that we went up to 96 and they were installing it. I just remember it's like, oh, we're on this freeway thing. We went down in the area, probably in front of the road. You know, okay. So. Celebrate, yeah, the whole community. Sure. All right. So, enough of that. So now we're going to kind of turn around, go back, uh, go backwards and go north on Otter Lake. We're going to pass by Tamarack Nature Center, which a huge chunk of that land um, and Otter Lake Preserve in itself come up as far as what was donated later on. And if we're coming up Otter Lake, you look left, there's this, the elementary school. And then we're going to take a right and we're down going to County Road H2. So H2 is odd. <laughs> connecting West Bald Eagle and Centerville. I mean, it's never heard from again in the county. It's County Road H2. It just stops. And it's, it's an oddity as far as, you know, we understand why it exists. But, of course, I, I can't just, you know, stop there because on the other side is Buffalo, right, which is H2. They, it is the same line uh, going back and forth on that. So... And of Buffalo, of course, there's your Northwest. <laughs> so Northwest, you know, fine. It goes Northwest because it literally goes Northwest from the lake and connects up. But it is funny. This is the stuff that you find of plats or stuff that did not happen. So when you cr crossed over, it was Buffalo and it became sixth. And obviously that is not true today. So sixth was planned and it never happened. So that's basically, that was H2, right? But where's County Road I? Sarah loves it when I do this. Why don't we have a County Road I? It's over there, but how come we don't get it? This is Stewart Avenue. That's basically County Road I, just FYI. 
it was the best thing I got about Stewart Avenue. So I brought it in. We're going to so basically Stewart Avenue would be County Road I if it came all the way through. I am just moving on. We're back on West Bald Eagle going north. And of course, you can't talk about the Lake of Bald Eagle without talking a little bit about the island. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but there's been multiple owners over the years. It's a unique piece of real estate that we all know about um, that even Sotheby's has a difficult time selling these days, I guess. Uh, I did find it easy, you know, interesting, again, going back to determining where the, here's the notes that I was talking about earlier. This is one of two sets of notes, literally determining where that exactly where that island was. It was a big deal in that survey. I, I don't know really why it was so tough. Um, 1920 here, somebody's going to try to make some money and yeah. let's sell a dock. I think you could pull the dock up and that's going to take all the property with. Um, somebody was thinking about splitting it up and selling it off and subdividing it. Obviously, never happened. And that's, again, where you see the name of the island change as far as that's the ownership, who, who's got it. All right, so we're past the island, and this is the first time I've rotated a picture. So north is to your left because it's all elongated. This, so we, you know, it's, it's coming up on Hobie Lane and the courts and all the, that go with that whole peninsula that was developed. But you can't talk about Hobie without really talking about what's right here, and that is Solheim. All right, so this one I, I want to get right. So Solheim, meaning House of the Sun in Norwegian, was built in 1897 by E.H. Hobie. I don't even want to try to pronounce his Norwegian name, by, that's why I'm going E.H. Um, as a summer home for his family, the large property and land that it went with, the house and land, initially was, on the, was the site of the main house, guest house, carriage house, and a three-story barn. That has been lost since been lost. The estate served as the Hobie family summer retreat until someone after E. H. Hobie's death in 1940 uh, sold to the, the family members sold it off in the 40s. Um, and oh no, sorry, sorry, it be, they began. Sorry, uh, they donated big chunks of the land. If I come back to this map, and you'll see it. It's all sideways. Solheim, Solheim, Solheim Corporation. This is all Otter Lake Park Reserve. So pretty much because of E.H. Hobie and family, that everything from West Bald Eagle all the way over to Otter Lake is all open and preserved. So it's a huge tract of land. What's interesting about E.H. Hobie, he was born in Norway in 1860 and arrived in the United States in 1883. After partnering in business with, with, with Swedish Norwegian Council in St. Paul, he became vice counsel and eventually counsel for Norway and Sweden himself, both countries. When the two countries separated, Hobie received his, the title of Royal Norwegian Council and oversaw a region of eight states. Uh, then Crown Prince Olaf, and this is in 1939, and Princess Marta, so who would today, they were the future king and queen of Norway. Their grandson is now king of Norway right now. And actually, his wife was just in town last fall in the Twin Cities. Um, but they came through, the future king and queen, visited Bald Eagle in 1939 to honor E.H. Hobie Solheim at Solheim. The royal couple toured the United States, by the way, in that same trip. So here's the house, by the way. Is this what? So the only way you could, you could never see really get a good look from the street of the house because trees and just the growth. So since this construction was happening, when I drove by, I'm like, wow, I have to take a picture. Sorry if that's your house. But, I mean, you can see, obviously, the key indicators on this house, right? Look at the chimneys. So, anyways, Prince and, Prince and Princess, in that 1930 trip, met with the Roosevelts. And for those not here, <laughs> nope. They're at the White House, at the White House. Be clear. Thank you for that clarification. Be very clear. I don't want to hear people, hey, no, no, no. Sarah's, Sarah's chiming in my bell, and guess what? We're at our ending because as you go by, who said 7.30? Well, that's Q&A, Q&A. See, Sarah, I got time. Well, since I'm going to sit down for this. 
So, I, you know, I know a lot of folks that are from the bald eagle point of view know exactly where you're going once you get to this point. But I, I, I as a kid, as a young adult, I didn't. I bet 90% of the people in the White Bear don't know that you're in Lionel Lakes as you head around the lake to the north to go back into Hugo and Washington County. But there is that thin sliver that uh, welcome to Lionel Lakes and no parking. All right. We're much, we have much friendlier signs in the township and the city. But that is really what's in a name part four, Bald Eagle, Otter Lake. And Otter Lake, there's just not a lot of information, primarily because there wasn't hardly any, hardly any settlement around it. Part of that was Mr. Uh, I want to call him Mr. Solheim. It's not Mr. Hobie. Thank you. Mr. Hobie's family really donating those huge tracts of land to the county. And it's a marshy area lake. It's really not a good place to develop around. So I don't want to say, hey, Otter Lake is not worthy of talking to. There's just not much about it. That is fun. But thank you for coming out. Appreciate it greatly. Thank you.